Hello, I'm Jason Price, the director and founder of Teresio. This Sunday, April 25th, I'm going to be taking part in a special event to launch a new recording project of the Baccarini Cello Concertos with Nicholas Alstadt, Jonathan Cohen, and the exceptional chamber ensemble, Arcangelo. In this event, we're going to be talking about a subject that I find fascinating the evolution of the cello in the 18th century in the parallel development of the music that was written for it. In preparation for this event, I've made this short video. The violin was born in the 16th century, and frankly, it was pretty much perfect. Its model, dimensions, and how it was played have stayed more or less the same for nearly 500 years. But things weren't quite so straightforward for the viola and the cello. In fact, in the case of the cello, even its name was up for grabs. It wasn't until around 1665 that the term violoncello was first used. The earliest cellos were larger than the modern cello, and they were played differently too. Rarely were they given the zingy melody line. Instead, their role was to sit back and keep the tempo, playing the basso continuo part while the violins had all the fun. And then around 1700, two things happened. First, the invention of metal wound strings allowed instrument makers to build cellos with a shorter string length. And second, composers started writing much more interesting and challenging parts for the cello line. It's important to say that this was kind of a chicken and egg situation. Metal strings made cellos more maneuverable at just about the same time that composers started writing more challenging parts for cellists. In the 16th and 17th century, strings were made from the entrails of small animals, mostly sheep, cats, and goats. Gut was an ideal material. It could be wound, twisted, or braided into long, thin strands, and once it dried, it remained flexible and didn't stretch. It was particularly well-suited for the treble members of an ensemble, but for the bass members, gut had limitations. If you decrease the tension too much, the string becomes too floppy to play. If you increase the mass, meaning make the string fatter, it's too thick to play, and this is the primary reason why early cellos were larger. They needed to accommodate a longer string length. Otherwise, the lower strings would be either too floppy or too thick to play. In around 1660, someone had the genius idea of wrapping gut strings with a metal wire. And this was a game changer. The extra mass meant the string could be shorter and thinner and still produce the same low notes. This singular invention made it possible for luthiers to create cellos which were smaller but just as low in pitch. And for these smaller instruments, composers began to write music which asked cellists to climb way high up on the fingerboard with all manner of acrobatic variations. And just like that, this new string technology changed the size of cellos that musicians wanted in the type of music that composers wrote for them. I find it interesting that in the 17th century, strings were often described by the city in which they were made. Pistoi basses came from Pistoia, Venetian cat lines from Venice, Lyons from Lyon, and Minikins from Munich. This is John Dowland, writing in 1610 that the best strings come from Bologna. But something that's always made me a little uneasy about this concept is this. Why was it that Bologna became famous for gut strings and also for mortadella? In all seriousness, Bologna turned out to be a very important place in the development of the cello. It was there in around 1660 that the first metal wound strings were created. Bologna was also home to Domenico Gabrielli in the late 17th century, perhaps the most influential early cellist and composer for cello. 
And in 1665, Bologna is where the term violoncello first shows up in printed literature. Nicholas Alstadt's cello was made in 1749 by Giovanni Battista Guarinini in Piacenza. It's a spectacular instrument, beautiful, wide-flamed maple, glorious, golden, honey-colored varnish, and it couldn't be more period-appropriate to record these Baccarini cello concertos. Baccarini was born in 1743 and was just six years old when this cello was made. We know from archival sources that Guarinini was very much a musician's maker, meaning we know that he was in direct contact with the leading musicians and we can assume that many of the inventions and innovations that he made over his career were the result of direct feedback from musicians and composers. The one thing that we are sure of is that this new model cello, which was all the rage in 1750, was exactly what musicians wanted. I'm very much looking forward to this panel discussion on Sunday and to hearing the Archangelo recording. I invite you to join us for the live event at 2.30 Eastern Time, 7.30 in the UK, and 8.30 in Europe. You can find the Zoom link below I look forward to seeing you there.